First of all, thank you all very much for coming out tonight. I'd like to extend my thanks also to the University Bookstore and particularly to Professor McChesney for, um, for coming out and offering to make this wonderful evening not only a benefit for us and our knowledge of the, of the media democracy movement, but also a benefit for Reclaim the Media and for local organizing on media democracy issues, media literacy, and, uh, and uh, independent media issues that we're working on here. So before I introduce our guest, uh, Bob may be promised to say a few words about Reclaim the Media, so I will. We're an organization that found, formed a couple of years ago in Seattle uh, to provide a, a, an organizing hub around issues that were connected to things that some of the folks who came together to form the organization were all working on in different tangential ways. We're independent media producers, we're community radio broadcasters, we're educators, we're community organizers. And in, in different ways, there was this big beast that was the fact that uh, the media was, was uh, very consolidated and despite our, you know, whatever efforts we're able to do on, in terms of creating viable alternatives in the community media realm, independent media center movement and so forth, these efforts were always going to be marginal until we were able to jump right into the policy arena and make some impact uh, there. The results of our work and dozens of other groups like us around the country are ongoing and have achieved a kind of a prominence thanks to lots of grassroots organizing and in no small part due to Professor McChesney's work, which was uh, an inspiration and a guide for a lot of what a lot of us have been doing. So our website is reclaimthemedia.org. I encourage you to check that out if you haven't already. We have a table with some information up in the front. There are several ongoing projects that we're involved with, including looking at the uh, Seattle Comcast Cable Franchise Agreement, which is a place where we can have profound impact on media policy. Uh, and so check that out. Check, we have information on that out there. Um, and as a volunteer-based organization with uh, a low budget and so forth, we depend on small contributions to do the things we do, to plan events, to organize, to produce literature and so forth. So thanks for helping out. If you can help out more at our table outside, please do. In his book, Cold War on Campus, historian Lionel Lewis notes that when we think back to Senator Joseph McCarthy and the Red Scare period of American history, we observe that one difference between college campuses now and then is that now one has the freedom to express a much wider range of political views. Of course, Lewis was writing in 1988 before the Patriot Act and 9-11 took place. So whether that's true now or not, we don't know. But Lewis, his point in bringing this up was to say that that observation is basically wrong. That the real difference between then and now is that today there's a much narrower range of political opinions that are taken seriously on college campuses and in our society. Views that are recognized at all as legitimate positions worthy of debate or even of censure. It's in our media more than anywhere else that the boundaries are set for which, which ideas are inside or outside of the limits of political debate. Writing about the Soviet Union, media scholar James Curran observed that the Soviet media before Gorbachev was, quote, more restricted in theory than in actual practice, thus reversing the pattern of the West, where the media has long been more restricted in practice than in theory. Understanding how our media got that way and how we might change the situation is among the subjects of this book and what we're going to hear about tonight. The problem of the media is only the latest in a series of crucial works which have established Robert McChesney as the preeminent historian of American communications policy, as well as a fierce and articulate critic of the ways in which policy decisions have allowed our media sphere to be effectively captured by commercial and private interests, and of the consequences of that fact for American democracy. McChesney's other books include Telecommunications, Mass Media and Democracy, The Battle for the Control of U.S. Broadcasting, 1928-1935. That's part of the title of the book, not the publication date. <laughs> the Global Media, The New Missionaries of Corporate Capitalism with Edward Herman, Rich Media, Poor Democracy, Communications Policies, Politics, and Dubious Times, and Our Media, Not Theirs, with John Nichols. McChesney's work has provided crucial inspiration, education, and support for the development of a national media democracy movement 
including the Campaign to Save Pacifica Radio, the International Independent Media Center movement, the campaign around low power FM, and most recently the movement to prevent the whole hog deregulation of media ownership rules by the Federal Communications Commission. Professor McChesney earned his PhD in communications right here at the University of Washington after uh, his undergraduate education at Evergreen. He was also the founding publisher of the Seattle-based rock magazine, the, Ta uh, the Rocket, which supported the Northwest rock scene in the years leading up to its celebrated heyday in the 80s, and which lasted until, I think, 1998. Tamara, is that right? <laughs> Some year. No one's going to out themselves as rock writers tonight. McChesney is research professor of the Institute of Communication Research at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He is co-editor of the Monthly Review and host of the weekly radio program, Media Matters, which airs at the U of I NPR station. In 2003, he co-founded with journalist John Nichols the media reform group Free Press. And last November, the group hosted the National Conference on Media Reform in Madison, which pulled together over 1,800 registered attendees from across the United States and demonstrated clear, more clearly than anything else so far that the political issue of media reform isn't going away anytime soon. Help me, please help me welcome one of my heroes, Bob McChesney. Thanks a lot, John, for that terrific intro. You read it exactly as I wrote it. So, so how do I? I'm, here I, I write about high technology and I can't even put on a mic. It's like, uh, Let's see how this does. This is crazy. This looks like the bed size. It's got 18 remote controls here. I don't know how I'm going to even see what I'm doing. I want to thank you all for coming out. Um, it's really an honor to be here. I haven't been in Seattle for six years, and I've got some of my closest friends in the world here. It's very emotional for me to be back here tonight uh, to speak to this audience. And uh, it's also a real honor to be here because the group Reclaim the Media uh, that Jonathan uh, just spoke about is really an exciting group, and it's an extraordinary group, and it really represents, I can tell you, just last night I gave a talk like this in Berkeley in a benefit for another group called Media Alliance. And what we're seeing going on around the nation in communities like Seattle, in the Bay Area, in Chicago, really all over the country, are people coming together to organize to do exactly what the title is, reclaim the media. To have a media system that serves the interests of the people of this country, not the interests of owners and advertisers, a media system that's dedicated to helping people be able to govern their lives in a humane fashion, not simply pour money into the pockets of a handful of billionaires. You know, usually when I come to give these talks over the years, I've always been sort of the guy who's brought in to bum everyone out. I talk about how terrible the media system is, how powerful these lobbies are, uh, the disastrous things they're doing to our society, and usually by the time I'm done, everyone goes looking for the nearest window to jump out of. Sort of recently, I've got a new shtick going. I'm sort of the, the happy speak guy. Because after giving this rap about how terrible everything is, I can talk about all the actions we're taking uh, to defeat the current system, to change it and reform it, and reform it radically. And what's exciting is the amount of political organizing that's going on. What would have seemed purely hypothetical uh, just two years ago, uh, give some feedback for me. What seemed purely hypothetical just a couple years ago, can you all hear me still? Okay up higher. God, I should use this as a, instead of a breathalyzer. There we go. Uh, what seemed purely theoretical just a couple of years ago now seems practical. The idea that people can organize to change the media system, to radically improve it. Um, and we better do it. Because if we don't radically improve our media system and do it fairly soon, we're in real trouble in this country. I mean, I'm not starting from a position that things are really great and they might get bad. Things are terrible in this country right now, and they can get worse. They can get worse. We have a real crisis in this country, a severe crisis. Viable, accountable self-government is all but extinct here. We, the corruption levels we see built into our governing system in the United States today are at levels, I think, rarely equal in our history. One would have to go back to the Gilded Age, I think, to appropriate levels of comparison. And the media system in this country is a crucial part of the problem. It's built right into all the problems we have with effective self-government. It's not strictly or solely responsible for these problems, but it plays a significant role. It's not solely responsible. 
And any effort to change our society for the better will have to go through media. There's no way we can have a, a humane, self-governing society and keep our media system as it is with Clear Channel, Rupert Murdoch advertising, Sinclair Broadcasting, and these guys running it. It's simply not thinkable. They aren't changed sequentially, they're changed in tandem. We do the two things together. We change our media system, we make it more democratic, in the same process we make our society as a whole more democratic. <clears throat> but before I give you the good news, let's get everyone appropriately alarmed about the problems we face. Let's, let's really, let's, I think let's revel like we like to do in just how screwed up things are, because the problems I think are even worse than most people think for effective self-governance. But the good thing is in examining the problems, you can see the causes, and then you can go to solutions. Consider the decision to go to war. <clears throat> it's probably no more important decision a society can make whether to engage in a war. And there's nothing more important really that our media to do than to give the people in a society the effective tools to make that decision, whether to go invade another country or not, or to kill people, to get people killed, uh, and to spend vast sums of money and alter the peace of the world. Well, the United States in the past hundred years has engaged in a number of wars. Uh, overseas, outside of the United States. I don't know the exact number, but I think it's along the lines of 70 or 80. More? 100? Do I hear 110? <laughs> so, uh, in any case, most of these are these quickie carpet bombings where we just blow out some third world country and no one even notices. But periodically, um, you know, we have a land troop war, 1898, Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, where significant deployment of troops in a foreign country uh, or in many foreign countries. And what we know in almost all these wars over the last hundred years is the following. The President of the United States in office at the time of these wars wanted very much to go to war. The people of the United States in almost all these wars at the, at the beginning of the process didn't want to go to war. So the President was faced with sort of an interesting choice. Do I try to tell the truth as I see it and convince people to support my war policy and let the chips fall where they may, or do I lie? and try to drum up support for the war using bogus pretenses. Uh, regrettably, most of our presidents have, opted, presidents have opted for Plan B. And then the choice of the media is how much do they challenge presidential claims, uh, to challenge to get the truth out of them so the people of the country will know what the truth is as they deal with the decision whether or not to go to war. Regrettably, for the most part, our media has not done a very good job in that task. And so we've had wars like Vietnam, like World War I, where had the public been better informed, more honestly informed about the intent of its government, we wouldn't have had the wars. Many people wouldn't have died who died uh, as a result of these disastrous wars. So this was the legacy American journalists had when President George W. Bush came along in 2002 with his campaign uh, to invade Iraq and occupy it. The automatic decision of our journalists should have been, as soon as you hear the president demanding that we go to war, to reach for your wallet, to be highly skeptical, not to lower the bar, but to raise the bar. Say, look at the historical record. We've been, we've been down this road before. We're going to demand some very serious evidence before we're going to give you a pass on this one. Bush's claims for the war, as we now know, the two main claims, that there were weapons of mass destruction that were an imminent threat to the United States, that uh, Iraq and Saddam Hussein was a terrorist cell that was integral to the Al-Qaeda terrorist network, were both entirely bogus. Completely bogus, Minato, and there's no reason to think they could actually believe them. And the idea that he could believe them is almost irrelevant. That's almost more appalling that he could possibly believe them uh, than if he was consciously lying. Neither is a credit to the guy. <laughs> Yet unfortunately, and I take no pleasure in saying this, although it will help my book sales, um, you know, our press completely dropped the ball in what is maybe the most woeful chapter of American journalism history that I've ever seen completely dropped the ball on interrogating these claims by the White House and challenging them. Made all the more uh, appalling because if our journalists had just gone onto the internet and looked at virtually any major news source outside the United States examining these issues, they would have found compelling evidence to show the weaknesses of the claims being made by the White House. And now the truth is out and we're with the sad situation that we've had, a, we're in the midst of an incredible crisis that will affect the whole world, and our news media is significantly responsible. Some sense of how poorly our news media still deals with this problem, and will continue to deal with it, comes from this. It was just about a year ago at this time that a New York Times reporter named Jason Blair was drummed out of the profession. Some of you might remember Jason Blair. He was the New York Times reporter who doctored stories, made up quotes, 
Uh, he was cover of Newsweek magazine, all the cable TV news channels, ran Jason Blair right out of the profession for doing what is agreed to be highly unethical, uh, making up stories. He should be run out of the profession. In fact, the top two editors of the New York Times resigned in shame uh, because they'd sponsored Jason Blair's careers and all these stories that were fraudulent. At the same time that Jason Blair is being run out of the profession, another New York Times reporter, Judith Miller, was filing story after story about the imminent threat posed by Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. Stories which were revealed shortly after the war began in the Times itself as being largely fictional, based upon very highly self-interested stories uh, planted by people who had a stake in the U.S. invasion. But in the stories Miller published uh, under her byline in the New York Times, they were presented fairly uncritically. This was, in fact, a true situation. Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Judith Miller, despite being repudiated, still has a job at the New York Times. Judith Miller still appears on cable television news shows as an expert on the Middle East and other matters. But I'm here to tell you that when Jason Blair and Judith Miller both go to meet their maker, Judith Miller is going to have a lot more to answer for uh, than Jason Blair. But it's our media system that allows her to stay there, in place, ready to cover the next war, uh, the next event. Another place we see the problems of our media system, and I think even more depressing than the one I just gave you, I mean, if that's possible, but I think in perhaps even more important is electoral coverage. The whole point of a free press is to basically make it possible for self-governance to work. And where the rubber meets the road with self-governance is with elections, the ability to pick people to run you, get rid of them if you don't like them, and replace them. Elections are key. And even before you study the media, all you need to do is evaluate the quality of an electoral culture to get a sense of how well your media system is working, even before you look at the media itself. You just have to look at the political culture. What do we see when we take a cursory glance at the U.S. electoral culture today? We see a situation in which the voting rate in the United States is low and falling. Was it roughly 50% of the American population votes now during adult population during presidential years? High, mid to high 30% during off-year elections, and an odd number of years, depending whether you're in Virginia or Minnesota, it ranges from 10 or 12% to 40%. That's the voter turnout rate. Not very impressive. Not very impressive. Moreover, what we know about our electoral system is that voting in the United States is a class-based phenomenon, a largely class-based phenomenon. In the 2000 election, for example, something like 50% of the voters came from the richest 20% of the population. Half the voters came from the wealthiest 20% of the population. And actually, as I'm about to explain, that makes a lot of sense. The only surprise is that many people vote uh, when you look at the criteria for our elections. For one thing, very few races in the United States are contested anymore, thanks to the science of gerrymandering uh, coming up uh, in this year in the House of Representatives. There are 435 races. Uh, I asked a friend of mine who's a political commentator who covers these races, how many of these seats are going to be contested? He said there are probably tw 10 to 12 legitimately contested races for the House this year. The rest are all we know who's going to win already, long before Election Day. Michael Moore has done a famous, uh, he sent one of his researchers off to study this, and Michael Moore has got this new line. He says that there was more turnover in the Politburo under Stalin than there is in the U.S. <laughs> House of Representatives. More turnover in the Politburo under Stalin. And that doesn't even add in the factor of money. In the United States today, we basically have two elections. We have the vote that we all get to take part in, in November, or a primary vote, and then we have what's called the wealth primary, where certain Americans make significant contributions to candidates. As it is, only 4% of Americans engage in the wealth primary, 96% never take part in it. 4% of Americans do. And in the money that goes into the wealth primary, and it'll be roughly $3 billion for federal races this year, about 80, 85 percent of it comes to the wealthiest one half of one percent of Americans. Contribute 80 or 85 percent of the money in the wealth primary. And whoever raises the most money, statistics show, almost always wins the election. So whoever raises the most money long before we get to vote, the other 96 percent, the outcome's been determined in the wealth primary. So between the wealth primary and gerrymandering, um, you know, by the time the election comes, it's pretty much fait accompli. And as I said, the, only, the amazing thing isn't that only 50% of the population votes in that context, but that many of the population votes. It's a testament to the civic virtue of the American people that continue to go to the polls in that context. And if you understand that relationship, it's easy to see why the further one drifts down the economic ladder, the less likely one would see any reason to vote, why voting is in the United States a, a class-based phenomenon. As Thomas Patterson, the political scientist from Harvard, puts it, in the United States, the difference between here 
in other countries is the working class doesn't vote. Poor people don't vote. In this last election, one of the striking developments was John Edwards is running for president as a Democrat. Some of you might have seen his speeches. And in his, in his stump speech, he'd go on and on. He'd say, well, you know, we've got 40 or 50 million Americans who aren't covered by health insurance. I think it's really important that we have a policy that they're all covered by health insurance. And then the clincher comes. He'd say, now I know none of them are going to vote. But we ought to do it out of the goodness of our hearts. It's a moral thing to do for these people. Just think the bottom 50 million people just don't vote. We understand that's hopeless. That's the nature of our political culture today. The money comes from the rich, the super rich, and where does it go? Well, this is where the media starts to enter the picture. <clears throat> the $3 billion will be raised this year in presidential, Senate, and congressional races. The majority of it will go to pay for TV ads. It will go to big media companies. Uh, the average commercial television station today gets 13% of its revenues from paid TV political ads, 12 to 13% this year. In 1992, it got 3% from paid TV political ads. TV ads are the golden egg uh, that this system lays for the big media companies. And that's why, if you understand it, the four huge media companies, the largest media companies that own the four television networks, that also own film studios, are the number one lobby that opposes campaign finance reform. That's why the big media companies are to campaign finance reform with the NRA is to gun control. And that's why anyone interested in taking money out of politics has to be interested in changing the media system. It's impossible unless we do, unless we address media power. Now as for the content of these TV ads, the less said the better. Everyone likes to talk about the negative ads, you know, uh, where they say, well, this guy's not patriotic, or this guy, you know, lied about his war record, or this guy, you know, drove over a, a rabbit with his car. Uh, I think, actually, the positive ones are worse, the ones where they're playing football and hugging their kids. I mean, I'd rather see the negative ones. I mean, the positive ones are even more appalling. But they're all atrocious. The fact is, they're all an insult to our intelligence, every single one. But as the amount of political advertising has increased, it's become the lingua franca of our culture, paid for by the, through the wealth primary by the wealthiest few percent. And what we've seen as it's increased in power is the almost complete elimination of local television news coverage of candidates. It used to be when I was younger that the big thing for a political candidate in the 60s and 70s was trying to get on the TV news. We can forget that now. We don't have TV news to cover. In fact, the whole area of local TV news and commercial television is a dubious undertaking nowadays. I don't know what it's like in Seattle, not yet. Okay, I'm shocked. But I'll tell you, I travel all over the country. I have a chance to give talks and meet people and find out what they think of their media. And we do live in a very diverse country today. Different ethnic backgrounds, we have a massive wave of immigration from all over the world, but people speaking hundreds of different languages. You go to Queens, New York, literally a hundred different languages you're gonna hear. Uh, such a diverse country we live in. But I found the one thing that unites all Americans, the one unifying thread that we all share. Every American thinks their local TV news is the worst in the country. <laughs> so, so this is the way we're at. Our electoral problem is a media problem. Our electoral crisis is a media crisis. If we don't change our media system, we won't be able to change our electoral system. And then hyper-commercialism. That's the third great phenomenon I want to talk about when I go through the bad news. E elections and wars are easy to understand. They're easy to see the problem we have with elections and wars. They're news hooks. They're something we see. There's an election coming up. We see the ads. We see a war coming up. People die. It, it, it preoccupies our attention. Hyper-commercialism is something much like uh, urban sprawl or racism. It's a phenomenon that permeates an entire society. and doesn't always show up in a newspaper, so we don't necessarily see it. But I would argue that the greatest phenomenon going on in our media today, the striking development we're seeing that's generational, is what I call the rise of hyper-commercialism. What I mean by that is that not only is the amount of advertising and commercialism increasing in our media, but rather a more fundamental phenomenon is taking place. The traditional distinction in our media between advertising on one side, editorial and creative on the other side, the separation of church and state, or church and state, depending on your values, that distinction between them is disintegrating, it's crumbling, it's being eliminated. Because the, the, the business side sees so much money in the commercialization of the content that the integrity of editorial content is under severe attack. This is a mere, uh, an extraordinarily negative development for our culture. It's morally corrosive of public life. And it's this sort of hyper-commercial environment spawns the vulgarity we see in our media culture. Hyper-commercialism and vulgarity are two sides of the exact same coin. 
There's a reason why no one complains about vulgarity, genuine vulgarity on public radio or community radio or public access TV. Vulgarity is the product of Rupert Murdoch, it's the product of Viacom, it's the product of hyper-commercialized media looking for the cheapest, quickest way to grab your attention. That's when you get vulgarity, and that's, that's the type of culture it generates. This commercialization, this hyper-commercialism, is most apparent, but not solely apparent, with regard to what we're doing to children in the United States today. You know, this is a society that loves to talk about how much we love children. I mean, God, every politician who loves children, it makes you want to throw up. I mean, what we're doing to children is nothing short of obscene in this society. It's indefensible. We're taking the children of this country, I mean, advertising agencies now actually have research starting at the age of one or one and a half by gender breakdown, one and a half to two and a half boys, one and a half to two and a half girls, two and a half to four boys, girls, it's advertising and marketing to kids, trying to brand imprints in kids' brains at the earliest possible age, knowing that once you, the first one in to get that brand in there is most likely later on to have a customer uh, down the road. A recent survey showed that the average American kid going into kindergarten now knows 200 corporate logos or brand names. 200 going into kindergarten. What a superior education we're giving our kids in this country. Basically what we're doing is we're taking the whole group of kids in this country, we're dunking them in this commercial pickle jar, holding them in there for eight hours a day, then grabbing them out by the hair and saying, hey, good luck, kid. That's what we're doing to kids. Now what's the range of debate on this? Is this a good thing? Is there maybe, maybe I'm missing something? You probably suspect I'm not too keen on this. Uh, well, the range of debate tends to be from those who say this is a very bad thing, which are sort of people like most people, to those of virtually every pediatrician, nurse, educator, child psychologist, everyone who's ever studied says this is a complete disaster. What we're doing to children is going to produce problems for our society that we can barely begin to imagine. And it's going to affect all of us. So why do we have these problems? What exactly accounts for these problems? Is it because we have bad people running our media system? No. Our media system isn't this way because the people who run it are bad. I mean, look, some of them are bad, but it really isn't the factor. Even if Rupert Murdoch and uh, Raleigh Mays, the Clear Channel CEO, and whoever the jerk is who runs Sinclair Broadcasting, even if all three of them were like buy the world's biggest bong and move to the Marshall Islands and quit their jobs, <laughs> their companies would still produce the same content because whoever ran the companies would follow the same cues. They'd do it better or worse, but they'd follow the same cues. It's not bad people, it's a bad system. It's a bad system that makes it rational for people to commercially marinate children's brains. It's a bad system that makes it rational not to provide any meaningful electoral coverage. It's a bad system that makes it rational not to give us any questioning or interrogation of leaders as they take us into a disastrous war. And the problem here is our system is set up to serve the needs of massive corporations to make money, not to serve our needs. And if you understand it that way, our system isn't a failure, it's a smash success. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to do, and it's doing it well. But then where does the system come from? That's the logical question next. Why do we have a system like this? Well, this is where, understand that our media system, uh, we're told it's like this natural system. You know, like God had a tablet with his plan on it, and he handed it to Moses, who handed it to Thomas Jefferson, who handed it to Abraham Lincoln, who handed it to General Electric and Rupert Murdoch, thou shalt run the media. And we're told this is the only way you can have it in a democracy. It's either this way or it's the gulag. Those are our two choices, A or B. And given that sort of view of the world, you say, well, I'd rather have this way than the gulag, obviously. <laughs> who wouldn't? And so I guess I'll shut up and stop thinking about this and go back to my couch. But in fact, that's not true. In fact, our media system is not a natural system. It has nothing to do with the Founding Fathers, almost nothing to do with them, and I'll talk about that in a second. And it absolutely has nothing to do with the free market. You've probably heard that one too, right? This is, well, this is a free market media system. They've got entrepreneurs competing, creating jobs, innovating, <laughs> lowering prices. <laughs> that's just a lot of hooey they feed us. Our media system has nothing to do with the free market. Our media system if you go down the 20 largest media companies in this country, if you go down the first 20 media firms, you're pretty much covering the, the dominant firms that control much of our media. All our film studios, virtually all our major television stations, all our TV networks, magazines, books, cable channels, cable systems, pretty music companies, pretty much the works in the first 20 companies. Each of them is built on a government-granted and enforced monopoly privilege given by the government, a massive subsidy what honest use of the language calls corporate welfare. Each of them is built on that. 
The gift of monopoly access, monopoly rights to radio and TV channels. The government says you can have a monopoly TV channel in Seattle and we're going to enforce it to make sure no one else uses it but you. That's a tremendous privilege for free. That's a spectacular gift of tremendous value that's given for free a monopoly right to a private firm. Radio and TV channels. As Barry Diller, who founded the Fox TV network for Rupert Murdoch put it, the only way you can lose money if you're given a government monopoly TV license is if someone who works for you is stealing from you. It's simply impossible otherwise. You're getting set up. You can't blow it once you're given a monopoly TV license. Or consider cable and satellite franchises. What's your, is it Cam, Comcast, the cable company here now? How many choices do you have for cable companies, John? <laughs> One. You know, I love these BS artists. Yeah, we like free enterprise, competition, lots of choice. There's no choice for cable in this country. You have one choice in every city. It's given municipal monopolies given to cable companies. It's a monopoly. Once you get that monopoly, you own the whole game. Once the government grants you that monopoly privilege, you can't blow it. These guys don't go out of business. They've got a monopoly. That's a tremendous privilege. Once you get it, you can't lose. It's not a free market. It's a government-granted monopoly. You know how many satellite companies we have in the United States, if you want to get satellite TV? Real serious competition for those of you who are Milton Friedman fans. Two. You know, isn't that great? D Rupert Murdoch's DirecTV and Dish TV. And you know why we'll never have three? Because there's not enough spectrum to support three. It's a scarce amount of spectrum there that can be used right now for satellite television. And then third, the third crucial sort of subsidy that's given to media companies, government monopoly privileges, is copyright. Copyright is nothing more than an artificial invention of governments to create a monopoly and protect a monopoly right. It's to prevent competitive markets. And the value of copyright, this has been grotesquely extended in the last 25 years by commercial lobbies, the value of copyright is almost impossible to, to calculate, but easily runs into the tens or hundreds of billions of dollars, even on an annual basis, the monopoly rights that companies accrue from copyright. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Policies are not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, policies are unavoidable. All media systems are built on policies. Even if someone's a free market libertarian fanatic, and I'm not one, but even if someone is, you need policies to set up a free market libertarian fanatic media system. It doesn't happen naturally. Policies are unavoidable in any society. And that's where you get to the problem in the United States with our media system. The policies that built our system, that allocated the radio and TV channels, that allocated the monopoly licenses, for, con for satellite and for cable, that develop the terms for copyright. And that's just a, the tip of the iceberg in terms of policies. Those policies have been made in the most corrupt manner imaginable. They've been made behind closed doors by powerful special interests without a shred of public participation. They've been made in our name but without our informed consent. I try to, I study this for a living. And, um, you know, I've been studying how these corporate media companies dominate the policy-making process and, and operate so corruptly, going back 100 years in the 1930s and through to the present day. And I confess I'm in awe of them. I mean, this, if you like The Sopranos, for example, this is, this is, this should be your stuff. You'll enjoy my books. Because these guys are really something. They're really powerful. In fact, the, uh, the metaphor I like to use to describe how the policy-making process works in the United States for media and telecommunications is to invoke the movie The Godfather II, has anyone seen that film? Skip, have you seen it? How many times? Just once? Oh, you've got to see it 10 or 12 to really appreciate it. There's a lovely scene about halfway through it um, where Hyman Roth and Michael Corleone and all the American gangsters are gathered on a patio in Havana. And this is 1958. Batista's running Cuba. The mob's running it. Batista's the head. Castro will come in power the following year. And it's Hyman Roth's 67th birthday. And he's giving a slice of his birthday cake to all the assembled gangsters, and they're dividing up Cuba amongst themselves. And so Hyman Roth gives a slice of his cake. Oh, Louis from Chicago, you get the Copacabana. Uh, Frankie from Detroit, you get the prostitutes. You know, dividing up among all the gangster families. And appropriately enough, so we get, make sure we don't miss the point, Hyman Roth's cake has the outline of Cuba on it. So everyone's getting a slice of Cuba. And while Hyman Roth is doing this, he announces to his assembled friends, isn't it great to be in a country with a government that respects private enterprise? Well, that's basically how media policy making is done in the United States. We have extraordinarily powerful lobbies connected to the big media companies, the National Association of Broadcasters and the various trade associations out there carving up a very lucrative cake with the outline of the United States on it for dominating our media system, and increasingly a cake with the outline of the world on it uh, between them. 
And just like if you remember the movie with Hyman Roth and Michael Corleone, it's not like it's a conspiracy where they're giving each other back rubs and high-fiving each other and having a good time laughing at the, the deal they're stealing on the people. In fact, they're fighting with each other to get the biggest slice of the cake. I mean, there's a war going on with them. We have over a thousand lobbyists connected to these various industries in Washington right now, extraordinarily high-paid lobbyists, not because they're worried about us, because they're fighting with each other. They're duking it out for the biggest slice of that cake. Uh, but the one thing they all agree on is it's their cake. We don't get a piece of it. We don't even get to know about it. We aren't allowed in the kitchen. We're not allowed in the patio. And if you understand that, you can see the, the task before us politically. We've got to change that calculus. We've got to take this debate off the patio, take it from behind the closed doors, bathe it in informed public participation. We've got to organize to do that. That's the key to success. Everything is based on that. That's the foundation. Myself, I'm willing to live with any outcome that comes from informed policymaking, informed debate. Uh, but our adversaries aren't. The corporate media, the Don Corleones and Hyman Ross, the last thing they want is any sort of public participation because they know their jig's up as soon as the world knows, as soon as the people know what's going on. They can't, their system can't survive. And the media ownership fight that we've engaged in that John talked about um, is clear evidence that they understand that once people understand they have a right and indeed a duty to create a free press, their sort of oligarchic control won't last very long in this country. To give an example of the sort of corrupt policies that would never survive if there was any public involvement, of any public participation, consider radio broadcasting in the United States. Radio broadcasting. In 1996, and I mean, once again, this is hard to, hard to categorize how, just how bad this is because there have been so many episodes like this, but in clearly one thing we've got in the hall of shame of media policy making. The National Association of Broadcasters wrote a couple of paragraphs and had it inserted into a law, the Telecommunications Act, which basically changed the ownership regulations for radio broadcasting. It had been for years that a single company is only allowed to have seven monopoly radio licenses in the country. Only seven of those, seven stations. And then it was raised to 12, and then it was 20. And then in the wild and crazy Reagan-Bush you know, go-go days of the 80s, it was lifted, I think, to 40, finally, in the early 1990s. Well, in 1996, the powerful media companies that want to get bigger and bigger were able to insert a clause into the Telecom Act, which lifted the cap entirely. You could own as many radio stations as you wanted nationally, up to eight in a single community. There wasn't a shred of debate about this in the House or Senate, in either Commerce Committee on the floor of the House or Senate. There was no debate when it went for a vote. It got almost no press coverage whatsoever, except in the trade press, where it was covered exclusively as an issue of importance to owners and investors, never as an issue of importance to citizens, to musicians, to anyone else. And as a result, what happened to radio is nothing short of a complete disaster in this country. Uh, in the three or four years following the passage of the law, 60, 70 percent of American radio stations were sold, from small companies to medium-sized, medium-sized to large, large to unbelievably huge. So a company like Clear Channel Radio now owns 1,300 radio stations. Infinity, which is owned by Viacom, one of our biggest monopolies, or media companies, owns 183 stations. And uh, before you write a check out of sympathy for Infinity for only owning 183, understand that they're in like the 20 largest markets where they're maxed out in the country. There's not a, you know, they, they've got right from New York, you know, down, are they here in this market? Infinity? Uh, I guess you're not, you haven't made the top list yet. Uh, at any rate, this is what radio has become. And what these companies have done, and understand once again, I don't fault the owners of Clear Channel and Infinity for doing what they're doing. They're rationally doing what they're doing. The criminals here are the policy makers that make the laws that create this system and make it rational. Because what these companies have done as a result of getting all this market power, they can own eight stations in a market, as many as they want nationally, is they buy zero out the local content. So local journalism has all but disappeared in radio, because it's expensive to do. Why do it if you can get away without it? And you've only got three or four companies owning all the radio stations in a market, and everyone's playing the game. Who needs to do the local stuff? Advertising is raised, and raised dramatically. We only had 11 or 12 minutes of ads per hour on radio in the early 1990s, now it's 17, 18, 19, depending on the market and the time of day. Uh, music playlists on radio stations have become a joke. You know, when you own 300 rock music stations around the country, you don't have 300 music directors who get to know the lay of the land in the community and develop a playlist. You have one person in corporate headquarters in Texas or wherever it is consulting with the marketing department to find the seven songs that will get people to respond most favorably to the ads. And that's considered a music playlist in our radio today. Radio is in complete free fall as a result of this policy change. It's direct relationship um, to this policy change. And as I'll talk about in a little bit, this is a crucial factor that led to the explosion of concern about media uh, last year and media ownership.
But if the American people ever debated radio, there's no doubt we would never have a policy like this. In fact, I'm pretty sure if we actually had a public debate, what would be the appropriate amount of radio stations for one company to own? The debate would probably settle between maybe at the low end one, at the high end maybe eight or 10, maybe 12 or 15 at the outside. But I doubt anyone would say that it makes much sense to have anyone own more than that. How come? Because the cost of doing radio is rock bottom. This isn't the car industry where it takes a billion dollars of capital to put on a signal. What the LPFM movement has shown us for a very small amount of money, you can put on a great signal. I mean, there's no reason these stations should cost so much. They only cost so much because the corrupt policy making makes them valuable as part of thousand station empires. If you could only own one station each, the value of these stations would plummet. And lots of people could buy them that can't afford them now. And I think that's the sort of policy we would have if we had democratic policy making. Now, let's talk about uh, why it's so difficult to change this system, what the problem we face. On one hand, it's Michael Corleone and Hyman Roth. It's an extraordinarily powerful lobby. And they've also got a tremendous advantage. They are the news media. They get to cover how people learn about this issue. And that has been a spectacular tool they've used shamelessly to their advantage. It's very difficult to find critical stuff about media policy making in the commercial news media. And the public news media isn't much better. Um, that's, a, that's a nice weapon to have in your arsenal if you're the commercial news media. But it's even worse than that. It's much more than this lobby. In addition, corporate power and, and corrupt policy making is protected by several key myths, key myths that are foundational. And I just want to quickly run through these. The first myth, and I talked about it earlier, is the idea that this media system, whether we like it or not, is the one that was meant by the founders. The founders of this republic said government shall make no law or Congress shall make no law interfering or abridging freedom of the press. Well, that settles it. Government does nothing. And as long as rich people make money, that's what freedom of the press is, as long as the government doesn't interfere with it. Freedom of the press belongs to entrepreneurs to try to enter the press industry. And I think a lot of us sort of think that, but when I went back and studied the history of American uh, democracy and the founding of the Republic and the establishment of the Constitution, I found a very different vision of freedom of the press in the first hundred years of this Republic. And certainly during the debates over the Constitution and the implementation of the early, re early Republic of postal policies and others, what you find is that freedom of the press was not understood then as a commercial right for investors to make as much money in media industries, enjoyed by those with enough capital to purchase newspapers, but rather freedom of the press is seen as a social right we all enjoyed to a diverse range of viewpoints so we could govern our lives and live in a free, self-governing society. That was the theory that was involved. And what I discovered was that our founders, rather than thinking the whole idea of a free press was just to let commercial interests do whatever they want, let the market rule, let the chips fall where they may, instead thought it was crucial for the government to implement aggressive policies to encourage and spawn a free press. Uh, our founders, for example, Jefferson and Madison, the first two secretaries of state, instituted a policy at the State Department where three newspapers in every state were subsidized with printing subsidies from the State Department consciously put in place so there would be diverse newspapers in every state that wouldn't survive if left only to the market. Likewise, and even more importantly, was the post office. Uh, studying the history of the post office is a really amar amazing experience. And, you know, I think that today we think of the post office, we think of junk mail, um, you know, we think of just you know, wackos shooting off guns. Uh, and this sort of, it's sort of a source of ridicule and derision. It actually has an extraordinary and rich history. It is a crucial part of our press system. Uh, in, in the 1790s, over 70% of the traffic in the postal system were newspapers. By the 1830s, it was over 90%. The postal system in this country was basically the circulation network for all the print media in this country uh, in the first 100 years of the Republic. In most cities, it was only the largest cities you had newsstand sales. Newspapers were sent through the mails. So a fundamental question the first Congress of the United States faced when it came in to meet it had a constitutional uh, demand that it set up a national post office, and it would become the biggest institution in the federal government. The fundamental question the founders had to deal with, the first Congress had to deal with, is what are we going to charge newspapers to be mailed? What are we going to charge newspapers to be mailed? Now, you would think today, listening to these blowhards, that, of course, waving copies of the wealth of nations, the founders stood up and said, these guys have to pay full freight. This is a free market. No, no free lunch for these deadbeats. Free market press system, freedom of the press. That's what you would think. In fact, that's not what took place at all. The range of debate in 1792 was this. At one extreme position uh, were those who said we had to heavily subsidize the postage, the sending of newspapers through the mails, heavily subsidize it to encourage a diverse press. That was one extreme position. The other extreme position, way out here in the debate, that of James Madison, among others, was that all newspapers at all times should always be sent for free 
any charge for postage would be a form of censorship that could lead to a very, an unhealthy political environment. It was the job of the state to subsidize a diverse view, range of viewpoints and not allow it to be determined by what people with money thought was acceptable. This was the range of debate. Now, Madison's side didn't win. This side won. But that was the debate they had. They had to have diverse range of viewpoints. It was an enormous subsidy, the largest expense, in effect, of our government for decades was subsidizing the distribution of a diverse news media. And think about what happened. In 1830s, when Tocqueville came to America and he looked over the country, one of the things that most struck him in the northern states in particular was the extraordinary degree of literacy of the American population across class lines. He was struck by that. More importantly, he was struck by the range and plethora of print media in this country, far above what you would find if you crossed the Great Lakes into Canada, much more than France or Britain at the time. An astonishing degree of print media. And that wasn't an accident. That was the result of enlightened policy making. That wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for those subsidies. And it was very effective. The problem we have today is we don't have, we have policies, we have subsidies, but no longer are they made with democracy in mind, no longer are they made with our interests in mind, they're made in the mind of uh, Hyman Roth and Michael Corleone. The second great myth that we have to deal with as we try to deal with corporate media power is the idea that professional standards in journalism will protect us from commercial corporate influence, that trained professionals will be our barrier, our protection for free journalism, for independent press, trustworthy media. And I don't have time here to really go through the history of professionalism. I talk about it a lot in the book. It's a very important phenomenon for understanding our media. But I, this much I, I think we have to say, that to the extent that professionalism did give journalists some autonomy from owners, at its high watermark probably in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, to the extent that was true, it's no longer true. In the last 20 years what has happened is that powerful commercial media firms have seen how much money they can make by commercializing news, by lowballing the expenses to foreign coverage, to investigative coverage, by emphasizing trivial stories, and professional journalism has basically collapsed as a protection against commercial pressures on journalism. It no longer holds the strength it once did. Uh, one measure of just how weak uh, professional journalism is as a protection of the public interest uh, is to look at journalists themselves. It was just about 20 years ago, even 15 years ago, but certainly 20 or 25 years ago, if someone made the criticism I routinely make of journalism in our society, uh, talking about elections or war or just general coverage of political life, most working journalists would have recoiled. They would have been upset. They would have said, how dare you say that? We've got all the power in the newsroom. We've got everything under control. You know, you don't know what you're talking about, professor. Get out of here. Uh, we journalists have got everything under control. You're dreaming. Uh, no more. No more. Today, and for at least a good decade, uh, journalists are our number one supporters of those of us who want to change the media system. Journalists, more than anyone, know the deep problems in the commercial media system. Linda Foley, the president of the Newspaper Guild, the Union of the Print Journalists, says the number one concern of her membership, the number one concern, way ahead of jobs, security, way ahead of health care provisions, the number one concern of her membership is how commercial pressures, conglomeration, and corporate concentration are destroying the craft of journalism. People who got into the field to be journalists no longer feel like they can engage in what they wanted to do when they entered the field. It's their number one concern. That's why Linda Foley is on the Free Press Board. That's why Linda Foley and the, the newspaper workers are leading supporters of media reform in this country. Recently, a Harvard psychologist and a team of psychologists at Harvard completed, a, I think, a 10-year study of the professions in America. And in this study, he studied a bunch of different professions. One of them is journalists. And what this study concluded, it was released two years ago, after 10 years of reviewing American journalists, is that a majority of working journalists in the United States, due to commercial pressures they feel on their work, could be characterized as clinically depressed could be characterized as clinically depressed. So no, unfortunately, um, professionalism won't be a barrier to protect us in this system. A third argument, and this is one I could do a whole talk on, but I won't, I'll spare you, is the idea that no matter how bad the media system might be, how little competition there is, how much hyper-commercialism there is, no matter how bad I might say it is, it's just the way it has to be, because it is a competitive system. Firms are trying to make money, and after all, they're just giving the people what they want. Have any of you heard that one? I mean, I think I was in my crib and my mother leaned over and said, shut up, they're giving you what you want. I mean, I've been hearing that my whole life. <laughs> now, I spent a lot of time talking about this in the book, and the reason is it's the, most, it's the most difficult one to answer, to be honest. And the reason it's the most difficult is there's an element of truth to it, much more than the first two. And the element of truth is this. No Hollywood company makes a film people aren't going to want to go see. 
No one puts a TV show on that people aren't going to want to watch. No one records a CD no one will want to listen to or buy. So at a certain point, it's self-evidence. Of course they're giving the people what they want. So if you don't like the content, don't blame the companies. Blame the morons who are demanding it. That makes perfect sense. The problem with this argument, though, is it takes a very complex relationship and it turns into an extraordinarily vulgar and simplistic one. It sort of starts from the premise that people are, at birth, born with a complete slate of preferences for what they want at media, at birth. They've got it, it's already there. I don't know, they get it sometime in those nine months they're in there, maybe even before that, who knows. But at birth, you've got your full slate of preferences. And then as you grow up, you start lobbing fish to the barking seals, the media giants who will try to please you and give you what you want. It's a one-way flow, demand creates supply. In fact, it's very misleading, because demand doesn't only create supply, supply creates demand. It's a complex relationship. And let me give you an example of how that works. In the mid-1970s in the United States, roughly 10% of the movies shown in American movie theaters were foreign language movies, 10%. Here in Seattle, I don't know what the scene is now, but you know, a lot of you who were, lived there in the mid-70s know how many foreign language cinema screens we had in the city. It was, amazing. I think it was seven, eight, nine, 10. It was a lot. In Manhattan, in New York City, there were 25 foreign language movie theaters alone, just in Manhattan, only showed foreign language films. By the mid-1980s, the percentage of films that were foreign language films in American theaters shot down, dropped down to like four or five percent, maybe a little less. By the mid-1990s, it was under one percent. And now if you take out Aramaic, and don't include that, um, the figure is probably down to like one half of one percent, foreign language films. Now, if by the give the people what they want theory, how would you explain this? Well, the way you'd explain it is this. At some point in the late 1970s and thereafter, the American people stood up en masse, slammed their fist on the table, and said, get those foreign films out of our theaters. We don't want to see them anymore. We're not going anywhere near your theater as long as I see a foreign film on that screen. And our obedient media giants gratefully and graciously pulled them out, probably reluctantly, because they <laughs> seemed to like them at one point. Well, in fact, that's not what happened at all. That's not what happened at all. What happened was this. Starting in the mid-70s, single-screen theatrical distribution of films basically died very quickly. It was replaced by the multiplex, the multi-screen theater. Because if you're showing eight screens with one popcorn taker, one ticket taker, and one projectionist serving all eight screens, the one that's got one screen with the same overhead can't compete. It was a very short period of time until all the single-screen theaters went under. The whole network of foreign language films no longer existed to be replaced by the multiplex. And then when the foreign language film producer came to the United States to distribute their film, they would go to the General Cinema Company or some other theater, theatrical chain. they say, certainly you can be on our, our mall or whatever, our multiplex. We've got 70 screens you'll have to be on. And you'll have to pay $2.7 million for the TV campaign the four days before it to, you know, to, to get your slot there other, if you want that slot. And some of them would pay the money and keep the, this role in the theater. Some of them would. But some would drop out who couldn't afford it. And then over time, more and more would drop out. And pretty soon, the practice dried up. No more foreign language films were shown in American theaters. Uh, and by the 1990s, it was true. They were giving the people they want. There probably wasn't much demand for foreign language movies anymore. Like, I was teaching a class in Madison in the 1990s. And I remember a student said to me, hey, man, when did they start making movies in France? You know, <laughs> yeah. you know, whoa. But I'm sure that kid, when he went to a video store, never stopped at the foreign language section. You know, he just whizzed right by it, probably thought it, was, it wasn't even movies, didn't even know what it was, just shot right by it. And then that section just shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and no longer exists. People are never exposed for it, they never develop a taste for it. That's the problem with the market, it seems sort of arbiter, a legitimate arbiter of taste. It's very ineffective in that sense. Moreover, markets give the people what they want, but they only give the people what they want within the range of what's most profitable for firms to make in the short term. And that's very often a much narrower range than people want to pick from or should pick from, uh, or should pick from. For example, you might watch the Jerry Springer show. And I confess, am I among friends here, Jonathan? I've watched the Jerry Springer show. I confess I have. Yeah, okay, thank you. Stand up, brother. No. We've got other people who have watched the Jerry Springer show. But you know, even though I watch this Jerry Springer show, that doesn't mean I want more money. I wouldn't like more money to go to public broadcasting, even though I'm watching Jerry Springer and not watching Louis Rukeis or whatever they've got in public broadcasting. Just like even though when I have a holiday, when I have a vacation, I'd rather go with my friend Greg to Cleveland and watch a Browns game and drink beer for a weekend than go to a national park. Now, by that give the people what they want theory, that would mean I don't want any national parks. I'd just soon get rid of them because I don't go to them. But in fact, as a citizen, I want lots of national natural parks. Just like even though I watch Jerry Springer, that doesn't mean that's the only media I want our society to have. 
It's bigger than me. The market can't reflect all our values, all our interests, all our tastes. It takes a very complex person and reduces it to an extraordinarily simplistic person. And most finally, and I think this is something to keep in mind, going back to hyper-commercialism, uh, a recent survey done by the American Association of Ad Agencies that came out three weeks ago, was published in the New York Times, shows that American contempt for advertising is intense and it's growing. Over 60% of Americans think there's far too much advertising in American media. Over 60% of Americans. Think they're going to give you that one? Think you're going to turn on the dial and suddenly there's going to be half as much advertising on the air? Don't hold your breath. They'll give you what you want, but only within the range of what they can make the most money. And then when you consume what they give you, they say they're giving you what you want. It's a circular argument. Then finally, uh, the last uh, great myth we have to fight through is the idea that we don't have to worry about ownership, we don't have to worry about policy, we don't have to worry about the corruption of the system and its problems, because the internet will set us free. <laughs> Technology will do our work for us. All we need is our Starbucks coffee and our, coffee and our mouse, and sit back and we're ready to rock and roll. We can blog each other until we die, and we'll live. we don't have to worry about Rupert Murdoch. Now, I say this, you probably sense I'm not a big fan of that argument, and I'm not. But I don't mean to demean the importance of these technologies. They're absolutely foundational, and they're absolutely critical. But technologies are the result of policies. They will develop how policies make them develop. They're not natural exogenous forces that fall out of the sky and land on the landscape. Uh, the, the Internet itself is a testament to socialism. It was a massive public policy subsidy. It never would have survived if it had been left to the private sector. In the 1970s, the government went to AT&T and said, will you take this thing over? AT&T said, no, we can't make any money off this, so you keep it. It's government subsidies that built this, it's public policy. Today, for example, we stand on the threshold of a wireless technology with the internet, where within a few years, we will have the technology that we could offer broadband service as a public utility, wireless to everyone in this country, uh, where the last mile from the trunk lines that are already built could be free, to, could go to everyone's country wireless for free, with a speed that's vastly greater than what it currently exists, and the uplink is just as fast as the downlink. We have that technology, but it will not happen unless we have the politics to make it happen, because there are crucial policy fights in terms of getting spectrum, in terms of making it possible for nonprofit, non-commercial, uh, municipally owned uh, wireless systems to come into place, and we're going up against Don Corleone, and we're going up against Hyman Roth, the telephone and cable companies who want to do everything in their power to make sure those two wires strangle us and they're the only way we can have broadband. So the technology can set us free, but only if the policies put it in place to set us free or to liberate us. It won't do it on its own. In short, it all comes down to popularizing policy making. And here's the good news. You're right, where's the good news of this talk after all? This guy's got a lot of talk here. The good news is simply this. Two years ago and before, it seemed hopeless. I'll be the first to admit it. I'd write these depressing books. It seemed like this industry is too powerful. In 2002, uh, we saw the beginnings, well actually the movement began earlier to be fair, and in the book I talk about it there, we see antecedents going before it. But in 2002, late 2002, the Federal Communications Commission announced it was going to be uh, reviewing its major media ownership rules. And during the course of 2003, we saw this vast explosion of interest in media, quite unlike anything we've seen in, in my lifetime, in generations really. Uh, we saw by the end, to give some sense of how this works, in, in January of 2003, I was uh, in Washington, D.C. The, the rules changes had just been announced. The SEC was going to review these key rule changes. And Michael Powell, the head of the SEC, made it clear he wanted to relax the rules to let media companies get a lot bigger. Uh, and there's still a lot of, right now there's still concern building. And they had a call to hearing in January of 2003 at the Senate Commerce Committee, the committee that regulates uh, the FCC and media ownership in the United States. And it was a hearing basically to talk about how terrible radio is. And they called in Lowry Mays, the uh, CEO of Clear Channel, and he was being grilled by all the senators. The senators are getting lots of complaints about radio uh, from their constituents. And one of the senators stood up. Uh, the senator's name is, uh, what's the guy from Nevada? John Ensign. I don't know if any of you have heard about this esteemed U.S. senator. You're fortunate, it sounds like. You haven't. Uh, you, remember, you remember the film The Godfather II I told you about? Remember the Nevada senator in that movie? This guy's cut from the same ethical cloth. And so John Ensign stood up and he goes, I'll have you know that in my career in politics, I've never heard anyone complain about radio or the media in this country. I don't think there's an issue here. They're giving the people what they want. That's what he said. And he sat down and put a big smile on his face and that was the end of what he had to say. 
And you know what? I think he was telling the truth. I bet he'd never heard a complaint from his constituents about radio or media ownership. I'm willing to bet that was the truth. I think he was looking us in the eye and giving us a straight line. But I'll tell you this, by December of 2003, John Ensign, and there wasn't a single member in the House or Senate who didn't have at least 500, maybe 1,000 of their constituents contact them and say they didn't like media concentration. At least 500 or 1,000 of their constituents, not a single member of the House or Senate in this country. And was, a lot of it was due to people like John, to the group I work with, Free Press. It was due to an enormous outburst of organizing by local groups around the country. Amazing work. Uh, I just on Monday had a chance to talk with Pat Cadell, the legendary pollster who did Jimmy Carter's polling in 1976. He did George McGovern's polling in 1972. And he was tracking this issue. And he said he's never seen such an outburst of opposition on issues almost spontaneous across the political spectrum, the intensity of it. So he's never seen anything like it. People who watched Congress said that this was the number one issue that they heard about uh, throughout the year last year, people's opposition to the concentrated ownership of media. Uh, only the war in Iraq exceeded it. This is the only issue that wasn't really run by an organized corporate campaign, a PR campaign, that had done such a phenomenal job of generating popular interest. As it is now, we stand in a situation where this movement is building up steam at an extraordinarily rapid rate. It's a difficult fight, uh, but it's growing uh, with extraordinary speed. I mean, the way, one way to put it would be to look, as I said, at the three million people who have contacted uh, the FCC or Congress in the last year to register their opposition to concentrated media ownership. But also consider a group like Move On. I suspect many of you are familiar with MoveOn.org. They, they've been foundational in a lot of the work that all of us have done in, in helping us generate support for this. Move On, as you know, did a lot of work against the, the war in Iraq, opposing the Bush effort to lead to the war. Well, Move On, basically what happened is they were leading the fight against the war, and then someone at Move On was standing around in March of last year, and they saw that Media Alliance was organizing this hearing at the FCC in the Bay Area. And Michael Copps of the FCC was there, and a thousand people filled this room and were complaining about concentrated media ownership, and they didn't like uh, what was going on in radio and television in their communities. And the head of Move On was sitting there, and he lives in the Bay Area, and he's listening to this amazing outburst of interest. And then he finds out by listening to this that the companies that are leading the fight uh, to relax the media ownership rules, Clear Channel, Sinclair, Rupert Murdoch are the same companies he's been organizing against for lying about the war, for propagandizing about the administration. So he adds two plus two. Is it a good idea to let Sinclair, Clear Channel, and these guys double or triple in size? The same guys who've been lying to push us into war. Not a good idea. So that led them to make this an issue. And what Move On found out that they got more popular response to oppose media concentration than they did to the war. That's how much this issue took off. And of course, it helped move on, and it helped all of us who were organizing that Michael Powell, the head of the FCC, uh, who's a big fan of media concentration, announced as the war was being launched that he wasn't concerned about relaxing media ownership rules. He wasn't concerned about having co many more media concentration, because he thought the Fox News Channel and the commercial media were doing such a great job of covering the war, there was nothing to worry about. <laughs> that was great news for Move On. What was interesting about this struggle and why I think it's important, and I'll close on a couple comments here, is, is, is it's not a left-right issue. It really isn't. This issue struck a chord that cut right across the political spectrum of this country. The survey data over and over showed what, as soon as people knew this was an issue, they opposed media concentration. As soon as people, it's like instant, as soon as people understand that this is an issue out there they can control, they opposed it. Uh, the number is 70, 80, 90 percent, depending on the poll. The more people know, the more they oppose media concentration across the political spectrum. Uh, during the struggle last year, the NRA uh, was instrumental in helping us. Some of the conservative media groups were. Their support is wavering because of pressure from the Bush administration. But I'm confident, I'm confident we're going to win this issue. The major barrier we face right now is that, the, is that the political powers that be are not our friends. The Republicans who dominate the FCC, are in the pocket of industry. The Republicans who dominate the House and Senate are in the pocket of industry. And the Bush administration is in the underpants of industry. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're completely in, dominated by these guys. But I want to let you know that we're going to win this fight, and I'm, I'm confident of it because I know that when we organize, it's like throwing seeds on 10-foot deep Iowa topsoil. We're getting no opposition. Everyone gets it. People understand it's not right to have one newsroom in a community. And if these rules go through, we're going to have a situation in most cities in this country. One company will own the daily newspaper, three TV stations, 
eight radio stations, the cable system possibly, the billboard monopoly, and an ISP, one company. And what they're going to do, because it makes perfect sense business-wise, one newsroom serves all. You have one newsroom generating the news for a community. Maybe two if you're lucky. That'll be considered a wild and woolly town, two newsrooms. That's the world we're moving toward, because uh, that's the world that makes the most money. That's the world of Hyman Roth and Michael Corleone. That world is unacceptable. That world is simply not a world we can afford to live in. It is not a world we can possibly accept, and we won't accept it. And it's going to change, and it's going to change because people are rising up, as I said. And I want to return now to Jonathan's group, reclaimthemedia.org, or that's your website, but Reclaim the Media. Uh, and groups like Media Alliance that I just came from the Bay Area. We've got a number of these that are starting all over the country. And what's exciting about these groups is this is not just a national issue. One of the exciting things about media activism, it's also a local issue. Fighting these cable companies to make sure you get the, the funds you're due for public access channels. Uh, getting low power FM stations in your local community. Uh, getting the ads out of schools. Getting work, billboards out of working class neighborhoods. Get those malt liquor ads off the billboards. These are fights you can win in the local community. They're policy fights. They're fights at City Hall. They're fights at the county office. You can win there. And what happens is when people win one of these fights, when you get the liquor ads out of the working class neighborhood, when you get really good funding for public access broadcasting, and some cities in this country have phenomenal public access broadcasting because they organized and won those fights. When you get that, people say, hey, that's cool. How did we do that? Well, you organized. You got together. You won, and then you go for something bigger and bigger. And that's the process we're in right now. Because what it all comes down to is the great line of Saul Linsky, and it guides all our politics. To beat organized people, you know, excuse me, to beat organized money, you need organized people. And that's what we have to do right now is organize people. Thank you very much.